Hi, this is Steve Blitzek for Evolution, This View of Life, the magazine that tries to approach everything and anything from an evolutionary perspective. Today I'm talking with Glenn Gare, professor of psychology at State University of New York at New Paltz. He's a founding and charter member of the Northeastern Evolutionary Psychology Society, otherwise known as NEEPS, which is a great society, a fun conference every year in the Northeast. And he's also a founding member of the EVOS Consortium, or EVOS Project, running out of New Potts and Binghamton, um, which is a fantastic project. So, Glenn, thanks for, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Looking forward to the interview. All right. Well, uh, what I've been doing is asking everybody to tell me, um, you know, uh, as much as they can about how they became interested in studying behavior or, or studying in science uh, from an evolutionary perspective. Sure. Um, you know, for me, it started as an undergraduate. I went to the University of Connecticut, and like a lot of psychology majors, I would imagine I was frustrated somewhat by the experience. Um, I liked psychology. I liked what I learned. I liked my classes, but I found the field to be fragmented. Um, I found it to be that one class taught you this, another class taught you something that was incongruous with that. Results were um, sort of tentative and theories were sort of small um, and accounted for small bits of phenomenon. I was kind of disappointed by my psychology major until I took a class called Animal Behavior with Benjamin Sachs at the University of Connecticut and immediately he made it clear that this was a class entirely about how the best way to understand behavior is from an evolutionary perspective, which had not made it onto the radar of any other class that I'd ever run into. Um, he brought rats in on the first day, a male and a female, a receptive female um, and a male, and he just said, watch what happens. And we watched rat mating behavior for 20 minutes and sort of took notes and documented what was going on and then he started explaining all the different phenomena because he'd been studying this stuff for years and years and explaining why there was sexual dimorphism, why the male was so much bigger than the female, why the female seems to show aggressive behavior under certain conditions, why the male grooms himself in the corner after copulation, on and on and on and how every single one of these things made sense from an adaptationist perspective went on to teach about evolution and the basic principles, went on to teach about animals across the entire spectrum and be behaviors across every behavioral domain you can think of, and evolution helped you understand every last bit of it. And from that particular point, I was hooked. Um, I went to the University of New Hampshire, which has a very strong social psychology program and teaching um, college teaching program, and studied social psychology there. Um, doing relationship research. But at some point, David Buss, who's a renowned evolutionary psychologist, came um, from Michigan to visit and talk about his book called The Evolution of Desire. And it hit me at that particular point that he was doing the kind of research that Ben Sachs was doing, but on humans. And it was, you know, I was a social psychologist doing what we called relationship research. Suddenly David Buss comes in and says, well, let's call this mating research and let's look at human relationship behavior the same way that we can look at rat mating behavior or any animal's mating behavior because it is ultimately a product of evolution. And from that particular point forward, I, it, nothing else made sense to me in psychology. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I wrote a paper a couple years ago with some young evolutionary psychologists for the journal Evolutionary Psychology where we documented almost the same exact account that you experienced. That is, uh, for, for me, it was um, in a social psychology class, there was about, about a six-sentence paragraph dedicated to sociobiology, at which point my instructor, who I respected um, uh, and also did sexual research, se uh, sexuality research, said, um, you won't have to know that. In other words, mm. it, it was just completely worthless to the study of social psychology and the humans um, in that particular class, and that was at Rutgers um, mm. University. And, and, and for me, those were the six sentences that made yeah. the most sense of everything. Yeah. Um, you know, having, having been a kid who loved animals and, and, and zoology and that sort of thing. Um, so it's interesting, your account is, is not unlike a lot of individuals' mm. accounts. It, it makes sense. 
Um, all right, let's move on to some of your research. Um, you sure. recently published an absolutely fascinating piece in uh, Evolutionary Psychology, the, the online journal, um, mm -hmm. about sexual positions. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, it, this was mostly uh, the brainchild of my graduate student, Ashley Peterson, who's doing her master's degree with me. And Ashley's very interested in um, understanding sexual behavior and, and essentially the main question we uh, used to approach this research was why do human beings engage in so many kinds of sexual behaviors that are clearly not tied to reproduction in a direct manner? Oral sex, anal sex, masturbation, lots of things that human beings do um, regularly are things that do not lead to reproduction. And from an evolutionist perspective, this is interesting because from an evolutionist perspective, things that are species typical should be adaptations, should be things that directly lead to reproductive success. Um, so we're very interested in understanding um, what are people doing, what are people interested in, and what evolutionarily relevant variables can predict um, interests in these non-directly reproductively relevant kinds of behaviors. And we found there was a very big sex difference. Um, males and females reported preferring um, vaginal intercourse equally for every other kind of position or act we looked at, males preferred it more than females. Um, there was a big effect for uh, sociosexuality, which is essentially promiscuity. Promiscuous people liked everything more than less promiscuous people. Um, and mating intelligence, which is a construct that uh, I developed here at New Pulse along with um, Jeffrey Miller at University of New Mexico and Scott Barry Kaufman, um, who's at New York University. Um, uh, shocks, my phone is ringing right now. And it looks like it's my wife. I'm just going to leave it be. Okay. If it's important, um, we can stop. No, you know what? No, I'll, show, I'll just leave it be. Um, so, so we looked at mating intelligence, which is essentially the set of cognitive abilities that are relevant to the mating domain. And we found that people high in mating intelligence had a significant preference for vaginal intercourse over other kinds of intercourse, which makes sense if mating intelligence is a kind of intelligence that seems to um, bear on things that will lead to successful reproduction. Um, so we we kind of found a difference. So those were some of the basic findings. Um, we kind of looked at the non-vaginal intercourse positions as um, related to short-term sexuality preferences. So um, there's been research by Hazan and, and Zeifman showing that face-to-face um, -face, uh, missionary style kind of vaginal intercourse uh, facilitates a whole bunch of um, brain regions and hormones that facilitate pair bonding. And a lot of these other kinds of things do not facilitate pair bonding. So it might be the case that someone who is a short-term mating strategist is less likely, is engaging in a lot of different kinds of acts, but is less likely to engage in acts that would um, facilitate long-term pair bonding. So we seem to be thinking of the um, enormous variety of, of human sexual behaviors that we tend to see as having an awful lot to do with differences in mating strategies um, between long-term versus short-term strategies. Huh. Wow. So that's that's fascinating, right? Um, but you mentioned a construct that I spoke with Scott Barry Kaufman about just a couple of days ago. I, I did one of these video interviews with him as well. And, and I asked him to give me a definition of this construct mating intelligence. Um, and, and the reason being is that when I mention it to people, um, I, I don't know if it goes over their head or, or if I'm not explaining it in an eloquent way, which is probably the case. But, you know, I asked Scott, I said, if you could give us a definition of mating intelligence for my grandmother, um, what would it be? In other words, you know, what's the take-home message for the for the person who reads evolution this view of life who might not be an evolutionary psychologist? What is mating intelligence? And, and then and then a follow-up question to that is, can we can we consider mating intelligence a continuous construct that's applicable across species, or is it or is it a discontinuous construct that only applies to 
maybe humans or 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 or, uh, or great apes? Uh, I think it's an excellent set of questions. Um, I'll try to answer them in, in turn. The first one is uh, I'm interpreting is what's a straightforward, simple definition of mating intelligence? Yeah, um, an operational definition. Yeah, I, I think I, I would just say the cognitive processes that are relevant to the domain of mating. So mating includes um, it, it includes courtship, it includes uh, early relationship behavior, it includes uh, moving toward monogamy, pair bonding, um, it includes things like infidelity, it includes things that maintain a pair bond later in a relationship, um, issues regarding relationship dissolution, um, choosing an optimal mate, realizing your, uh, your particular value in a mating market being able to assess a mating market in terms of um, appropriate number of partners and make appropriate choices or optimal kinds of choices within that kind of market. So there's an awful lot of domains that that sort of sit within mating proper and all the thinking that goes on involved in that is what we're calling mating intelligence. Okay, um, so before we get into the, the comparative question, let me ask you a question about um, if you could give us uh, and you know, if you want to use an example of a real media person or or just a, a make pretend character, you know, um, uh, sometimes for for people who aren't scientists, I'm collaborating with some English professors right now. It, it helps for them to have a character identification or a characterization mm -hmm. of the. So, so what is a characterization of somebody who has a maybe a high mating IQ versus somebody who has maybe a low mating IQ? Um, and I will say that that becomes a very difficult question. Okay. Okay. Um, not that I can't answer it, but but that it, <laughs> it but it, it really it shows the high complexity associated with this construct. Okay. So, for instance, we could think of someone who has been a very successful long-term mating strategist. Um, maybe Paul Newman would have been an example of someone okay. who had a, a, a wonderful relationship that was a renowned relationship, um, successful offspring, successful family. That all sounds evolutionarily successful, and he's someone who had a reputation. Um, and in a positive light with a lot of prestige and a lot of positive regard. So And I a low that, rate of infidelity. Right, and right. Zero, so so what I think that we can we can um, do is characterize mating intelligence is it's contingent, like a lot of um, evolutionarily relevant behavioral patterns. So we can have we can think about um, what a, a male who's high in long term mating intelligence might look like. We can also think about someone who's um, maybe someone like Jimi Hendrix or someone who was um, extremely creative, extremely um, attractive to the opposite sex, um, very conspicuous in his displays, and it was renowned for attracting lots and lots of, of partners. And from an evolutionary perspective, that can be seen as advantageous as well. Um, so we can see that as a different kind of mating intelligence mm. than what Paul Newman had, but also clearly intelligence. I mean, the way he played guitar was like no one else has ever played the guitar like that. Yeah. And, you know, and that intelligence transferred to outcomes that were successful in the mating domain, but in a short-term kind of way. So if you actually look at um, the book that Jeffrey Miller and I edited on this, or the final chapter is sort of, we, we um, have a coherent framework that ties it all together. And we talk about long-term mating intelligence, short-term mating intelligence, and then beyond that, male versus female um, mating intelligence, and these things end up being different. Um, Psychology Today a few years ago interviewed Judy Bloom, who I guess has had um, a very successful career, obviously, but she's also had a very successful relationship. She um, describes herself as very in love with her, her still her first husband, um, and describes lots of positive experiences with her, her offspring, who seem to be successful. Um, and she was interviewed about about mating intelligence for Psychology Today, and she said, "Well, it sounds like I've been lucky to have, you know." She put it in terms of her, her own fortune, but it seems like she made a series of decisions that led to success in a lot of domains, but particularly in terms of a relationship and and producing offspring. So we can see that as sort of female long term mating intelligence. Um, whereas wow. female short term mating intelligence might be that if there's like a bunch of um, Young young female adults that are out at I know in, in New Paltz so it would be P and G's but in you know in your town whatever the bar is where where they go out and yeah and it's all a, a, a big display kind of situation you know the females that are best at sort of 
hooking up with the high quality males or the most desired males, we can think of them as maybe having sort of female short term mating intelligence. So I think that mating intelligence um, uh, simply corresponds to the cognitive processes associated with mating, but when you look at how complex human mating is, it definitely has to sort of break down in this way. Wow, wow. Okay, so I think that's a great description. Um, the second part of the question was, is it a uniquely human construct, or or do you think these are, are, are things that span uh, uh, in other species? I think it's a great question, uh, and it's one that I hadn't thought about too much. Um, so... I'm kind of thinking about this with, with fresh eyes. One thing that we have talked about is the um, conditional nature of mating decisions. And someone who's high in mating intelligence will is able to look at the situation and say, here's an optimal way for me to behave in this particular situation. Um, if, if you're a male and you're at a, an engineering college, you might be smart to have different standards for trying to find um, a female than if you're at a male and there's mostly females, you know, okay. and, and there are probably some males that can um, sort of make those ecologically sensitive decisions better than others. Um, in lots of species we see conditional strategism. Um, we see behaviors where um, depending on the, the environment this behavior will happen versus this other behavior will happen. Um, so in, in wood frogs, for instance, and in, in our backyard we have in springtime, you just hear thousands and thousands of them in, in the, the courtship process. Um, the bigger males are the ones that tend to get the, the females, but they, they try and it's a conditional strategy and then some males will, um, if they're relatively small, they'll kind of figure that out and they'll be what's called a satellite male and sort of hang around a big male and then try to poach a, a female that that larger male has, has brought brought into the, the area. So that's, it's a conditional psychological strategy designed to optimize mating given the nature of the situation. So I would see that as, as, as a form of mating intelligence. Hmm. And if we start looking at conditional mating strategies across species, I think that, that that to me is evidence of mating intelligence across species. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And then, uh, you know, you probably don't have data on that. I assume you don't have data on this, but um, we, we oftentimes talk in, in our biosite classes or neuroscience classes about the heritability of G or IQ. Um, I would assume, and again, I'm no expert in mating intelligence, I would assume that mating intelligence heritability would be high because, I mean, if it predicts mating success, uh, but, but again, I don't know if there's any data on that. Yeah, we, we simply, we, we sort of know and we sort of don't know. Okay. Um, the way that we, uh, when we write about this, we divide mating intelligence up into... Um, what we call the, the fitness indicator courtship component. Um, so like the Jimi Hendrix kinds of mating intelligence, okay. you know, the, the um, high creativity, conspicuous creativity that is high quality, that kind of, um, that kind of outcome is, is attractive and seems to have evolved for courtship related purposes. This is Jeffrey Miller's mating mind argument. Yeah, right. Um, and all that stuff has high heritability. Um, all the, the indices of you know your ability to draw verbal right. abilities, all these um, all these things that look like sexually selected fitness indicators um, seem to have high heritability. So we do have a lot of good data on that component. But whether specific processes like the ability to look at the sex ratio in an environment and make appropriate mating relevant decisions, or whether to look your spouse in the eye and know this person has cheated on me or this person hasn't whether the cognitive processes that are more directly relevant to, um, to mating are high in heritability, that, that still is an open empirical question. Okay, wow, excellent. All right, let's change gears in the interest of time here. Um, sure. Tell me a little bit, or, or tell our audience a little bit about um, your interest in, in something that you and I have been collaborating in thinking about with this evolutionary uh, or applying evolutionary science to fitness and nutrition, or, or what I what I generally think of as as physical well being. Sure, um, this is I think anyone who teaches evolutionary psychology, you eventually run into a classic example of what's called evolutionary mismatch. Evolutionary mismatch is where we evolved some tendency because things were this way back under ancestral African conditions, and things are now different, but we still have the same 
um, evolutionary tendencies. So the reason McDonald's is very popular is because it has high fat foods and high sugar foods and our ancestors developed a preference for those tastes because they were very unlikely to run into those and when they did they were successful relative to others because they could live through a drought and live through a famine because they could get put fat on their bodies. Mm -hmm. So over thousands of generations those taste preferences evolved because those kinds of foods were rare. The irony now is that under modern times those kinds of foods are prevalent everywhere, but not enough time has taken place for us to evolve out those preferences. So the irony is that stuff um, is now unhealthy, especially if you eat it in high, in high, qual um, high quantities. So I always use this as an example of evolutionary mismatch, and students seem to catch, to connect with it very well. Um, and that started leading me to a broader idea, and I think um, I know yourself, and I know my colleague Hamilton Staple, and a bunch of other people. Are sort of, once you start getting into um, human evolution, you really start thinking about a natural lifestyle versus an unnatural lifestyle, mm -hmm. and you start thinking about so many things that we do that are unnatural. Um, living in large cities, one thing that people have discovered is in large cities, you're much more likely to see psychopaths. You're much more likely to find people that have no guilt that will do horrible things, that will exploit others. Um, and that can happen in New York City because there's millions of people and someone can get away with it. It is an evolutionarily unnatural environment. We, we were designed, we, um, human psychology evolved in small groups where um, the highest number of people in your group was about 150 and you were related to about half the people in your, in your group. So we have a very unnatural, in a lot of ways we have a very unnatural living situation. It's particularly true in terms of health. Um, estimates vary, but in, in pre-westernized societies, um, people tend to, on average, walk between 10 and 20 miles a day. Um, we don't do that now. I'm sitting, <laughs> right? I'm yeah. sitting in front of my computer. You're sitting in front of your computer. I mean, you have to. You've got to make yourself engage in these kinds of behaviors because if you wanted to, you could just sit in a chair all day long. Right. Right, and the food offerings you could run in. You could eat stuff that just tastes good all day long without thinking about the issue of natural foods. So once you start thinking about what kind of foods existed before agriculture, and what kinds of activities um, were our ancestors engaging in before agriculture, as an evolutionist, it dawns on you is that's what we should be doing um, to to get the most out of life, to be as healthy as possible. And 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 you provided evidence um, in some of our collaborative research that. It leads to mental well-being as well. Um, that living a natural lifestyle leads to um, more positive mood, better sleep, less irritability. It obviously leads better to better test scores. Better, better test scores. Yeah. Right. I mean, college students are going to like that. So, <laughs> um, so yeah. So here at New Paltz, we have put in the paperwork to have a course called Evolution and Human Fitness, and Hamilton Staple is on the books to teach this next summer. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, and we're, uh, we're, there's a lot of excitement among, among students because when the students learn about this, because they understand evolution, particularly students in our evolutionary studies program, they get it. You right. know, the, student, the students get it. Once they get it, they obviously see that fitness is something that should fall in line as relevant to evolution as well. Do you think that your students adopt that, that, that lifestyle? Some do. I, I have definitely had students come up to me and say, hey, you know, I learned about this Paleolithic diet. It seems to be totally related to the evolution stuff you teach about, and I'm doing it. And I've had several students across the past uh, several years do that. I have one student now who's um, just got into a nutrition master's program somewhere in Connecticut, and her entire goal is to become a nutritionist who, who pushes an, an evolutionarily informed um, nutritional approach. That's fantastic. So, that, yeah. Now, um, uh, we're, in fact, we're going to talk to uh, um, quote unquote paleo god. Uh, Rob Wolf has agreed mm -hmm. to do uh, a video cast with me. Yeah. I know he's coming up to uh, or over to New Pots to do yeah. some talks. Very excited um, about that. Are you, are you, um, uh, yeah. when I talk to people about, about this idea and this project, um, I get a lot of I get a lot of negative feedback 
from people who are not evolutionists, from people who are not uh, familiar with how the the biological mis you know Bowlby mismatch theory that sort of thing, and and it, and it makes a lot of sense. Now remember where I'm at. You know I'm I'm in Bible Belt Georgia here, so it, it's a little bit of an uphill battle. But um, you know one of the things that I try and teach my students and and uh, is lead by example and 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 live by the data. Um, you know I'm I'm approaching forty years old. And I'm I'm in better shape now, uh, both both visually and physically, like at the doctor, um, you know, cholesterol readings, all that, than than I was, I think, at 17. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, been doing the paleo kind of diet for uh, about two years now, um, mm -hmm. and uh, doing some kind of evolutionary functional functional exercise. I, I wonder if you you know, after your experience with the ancestral health symposium. Um, uh, have you been swayed? Has your family been swayed? Uh... Um, you, you know, it's funny. I over the past five or six years, I'd say eighty percent of the time, I've been really good about eating in a paleo kind of way. Um, you know, I run and I lift weights and I go uh -huh. hiking and I, you know, do a lot well, of rock a swim. Somewhere in this Hang on one second. Okay, go ahead, Glenn. You know, and I and I and I. I think I try pretty hard to do that, and there's some sometimes maybe two or three months a year I, I might slip. But I'll tell you, when I get back into eating, and the decision rule needs to be—it's so easy. The decision rule is: could cavemen have run into this kind of food? Yeah. You know, you don't have to be. I mean, gluten-free is the is the most straightforward. That's like rule number one. You know, like the highly processed wheats and, and carbohydrates just did not exist under ancestral times before right. agriculture. Um, yeah, I've gotten uh, without question when I'm when I'm at my um, peak sort of paleo eating intensity, I feel great. Yeah, you know, and I feel like I can do anything. In fact, I was <laughs> in a um, I was in one of these extreme five Ks a couple of months ago. Oh really? And, uh, I, I was in a wave of about forty guys, uh, forty people, mostly guys. I was clearly the oldest person in the group, and I ended up taking third out of my wave. And it was you know, nice. and that was a time when I was just. I was there. I was doing it. I was doing the lifestyle. I was doing the so. There, there's no question that that I've seen this have positive effects. Um, you know, m I think my wife respects the idea, and uh, with our kids, you know, kids, it's kind of it, it's a little harder. Um, it's a little bit harder, but we're uh, you know we're certainly certainly shooting for it, and it's something that I believe in completely. The ancestral health symposium, which just happened at UCLA, was an absolutely amazing experience. Um, there was about 600 people. The numbers were much higher than they anticipated. People were in extraordinary shape, and one talk after another after another, pretty much just underscoring in lots of different ways in terms of your physical behavior, in terms of this kind of nutrition, in terms of dairy, and you know not eating dairy because that's not necessarily something our ancestors would have would have run into. Um, extremely convincing and the people that presented or were mostly medical doctors or PhDs with ex expertise in nutrition and fitness um, so people who are against this I don't think they're paying any attention and I think this is true about like people who say that they're against the idea of evolution I don't think they really know what evolution means right um, and people that are against the evolutionary fitness like I've had one one person you know I'm in a very liberal environment so I'm running into resistance but resistance that's different than what you run into in in Georgia I would imagine I, ha I had one person who's um, been pretty pretty vocal about about this course that we're developing and we ran into a lot of resistance at, at the one Senate level it had to go through there was resistance at the curriculum committee I mean it eventually got approved but there was extraordinary resistance and the one thing that is consistently coming up is people say well People live longer now than they did 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 years ago. Therefore, the way we eat now is healthier than that. And I'm like, the reasoning on that is so, it, it, it makes sense if there's no other context whatsoever, <laughs> right. you know. But, but who lives longer now? The people that go to McDonald's every single day or the people that eat healthy natural foods every single day? Right. You know, I mean, it's the, the, the argument is so, but that's an argument that I've, I've encountered often from PhD level individuals. So yeah. I, I, I echo that. I, I get that argument a lot. Well, in fact, I get that argument from anthropologists, uh, PhDs, which blows my mind. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, that we live longer. And in fact, the data suggests that we don't necessarily live longer. That one of the reasons we live longer is because of something called an antibiotic. I mean, if paleo man, quote unquote paleo man, scratches his knee and falls in a pile of you know elephant dung, he's going to die of sepsis, right? But you and I can just go get a tetanus shot or or an antibiotic and. You know the the diet thing. I think personally, um, uh, you know, could account for a lot of things. Things like the increased rate of infertility. I mean, I, I have more friends that are, um, uh, you know, having problems having babies. That sort of thing. Um, you know, and, and diet optimizes. One of the things it's got to optimize is our gametes, and 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 probably you know part of the physiological basis of what we were talking about earlier, which is that mating IQ. Um, Absolutely. It'd be interesting to think about how, you know, physicality and nutrition affect things like mating IQ. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, well, I catch a lot of flack about paleo. In fact, uh, when I, I'm going to have a meeting this afternoon and when I go with my handful of nuts and coconut flakes and beef jerky, people will look at me like I've got six heads. Mm -hmm. People who are 300 pounds overweight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's great. Wow. So, so Glenn, you were doing a ton of stuff from from sexual positions to psychological constructs involved in the mating game to this evolutionary fitness and and well-being do you have any other new projects that you're working up that you want to tell people about um, I, I guess I'll just say briefly I have a couple recent publications on the um, the interdisciplinary nature of evolutionary psychology um, that if you look at um, psychology and you look at the fields represented in psychology journals, journals that are outside evolutionary psychology have a strong tendency to cite just psychologists and this is true for we've analyzed psychoanalysis journals, learning journals, cognition journals, cognitive neuroscience journals. Um, they vary a bit from one another but when you look at the evolutionary psychology journals including evolutionary psychology of which you're, you're a co-editor um, and evolution and human behavior everything changes and people that are publishing in the evolutionary psych journals are citing anthropologists, they're citing biologists, they're citing economists, they're citing literary scholars, they're citing nutritionists. Um, it's absolutely amazing and I have a blog for the Evolutionary Studies Consortium that I call Building Darwin's Bridges um, and it relates to this idea that David Sloan Wilson came up with that the ivory tower is not an ivory tower, that it's an ivory archipelago that there's a whole bunch of discrete islands. You have your island of sociology, you have your island of English, you have your island of foreign languages, you have your island of business, and all these islands are, are essentially totally separated from one another, and it's almost as if they're fortresses. Um, and so it, it's very hard for the ideas from one island to make it to another. Um, so my idea of building Darwin's bridges is that evolutionary theory has such a powerful way of making connections across the islands of the archipelago and we see that in the publications of evolutionary psychologists in the fact that they have no problem citing um, scholarship from from all different fields because evolution doesn't care about what field you're in you know the idea of evolution is relevant to any field the idea of evolution is the idea that things that work are more likely to exist in the future than things that do not you know, that's, right. that's really the the extent of it. So, yeah, so I've got a couple new publications on that that I'm really excited about. That's fantastic. And you shared that publication with me, which I'm, I, I really appreciate. And I was pleased to see evolutionary psychology um, uh, at the top of the interdisciplinary list. And, you know, what a great way to end this interview. For yeah. a magazine uh, that's supposed to approach anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective, to a scientist who's producing research showing that evolutionists or evolutionary scientists in fact do draw from all different disciplines. I mean, it just is coming together fantastic. Glenn, I can't thank you enough for being with me. Um, this has been really a lot of fun. Well, it's been great for me too, Steve. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks again. Well, here's uh, Glenn and me signing off for Evolution, This View of Life. Yep. Take care.